when God has been good. And this, this, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. But I see some of you. So let me rephrase the question. Maybe, maybe, maybe at this point in the worship, you can't say that he's been good to you. But let me ask you in this one. How do you know that God's nature is he's good? you to help me if you could uh, by thinking about it. what is it about this season that you enjoy? Okay? What is it about the season 
that makes you look forward to me, okay? I wanted to ask the question of you, what is it about this season that you enjoy? Did you hear my question? Yeah. Yeah. Now, we say an old church haven't had time to consider, okay? This is where you can help me. Anybody? What is it about this season that you like? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? The giving gifts. All right, all right. Anybody else? Well, being alive. All right, I like that. All right, I'm sorry? Togetherness? Yes, ma'am. The birth of Christ. All right. Anybody else? Memories? Okay. All right. How many of y'all finished shopping? You say for what? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. This is another season. Okay. All right. Um, the truth of the matter is that this is a season that affects a lot of us differently. Differently. It's a season of expectation. And for some, it's a season, as Minister Wright was offering in his prayer, it's a season of anxiety. It's a season some people look forward to with anticipation, and it's also at the same time some season some people look forward to with foreboding. While we jump up and down, we shout and we dance and we praise, some people come to this season with hearts that are real heavy. The recent study just released last week said that in our nation last year there were over 47,000 suicides. That it especially at this time of the year, following on the heels of Thanksgiving, as we go into the season of Advent, it's a difficult time for a whole lot of people. So we wanted to talk about Advent. Now, I want to be honest with you. The word Advent had not really become a part of my lexicon. I didn't grow up celebrating Advent. In fact, I grew up in traditional Baptist church where we celebrated the major Christian uh, days. We celebrated Easter and uh, we celebrated Christmas. And there, there weren't a whole lot of other religious holidays or days that we celebrated. But there are other faith traditions that have celebrated what we call the Christian calendar. They would celebrate Epiphany. They would celebrate uh, the birth of the church when we talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they, they talk about the Lenten season. Talk about different times of the year. In fact, uh, some other faith traditions have a day where they look every day, at the, every week at the, at the Christian calendar, come up with themes, ideas to preach on. But all I remember, the only other celebration we had where we celebrated Easter, but all we celebrated with Lent when I grew up was we would go around Deacon Green and we'd get these little things they called gleaners. Gleaners. And you put quarters in them. And we'd fill up one. With all these quarters, you took it to church. And that's what I thought that was. Saving quarters. <laughs> so we didn't celebrate a lot of the Christian calendar, but as I got older, as I became a minister, now a pastor, I've seen that, that maybe there is some value in us celebrating the Christian calendar. Four Sundays before Christmas are called the season of Advent. From the word Advent, we get adventure. Advent is about a journey, a coming 
uh, into the world by the Son of God. And those four Sundays prior to Christmas, we celebrate different things. And today I want to talk about a theme that is lifted for us in the Gospel of Matthew and also in the Gospel of Luke. But the theme I want to talk about is about expectation. I want to talk about expectation because a lot of us come to this time of the year and it is filled with different expectations for us. Some of us are expecting to get something real big somewhere about the 25th. I hope your expectations come true. Some, some people come and they're down. They're depressed. They're sad because of this season. Maybe someone who has been with them in a prior season is no longer there to celebrate the joy that this season brings. Folk are more acutely aware of being alone this time of the year than at any time of the year. And so for us, we're going to talk about Advent. I wanted to look at a peculiar text because Advent is really about the coming into the world of Jesus. But the text before us is about a young man and Jesus is already grown he has been baptized. He has uh, made his inaugural message. He has begun his ministry. And it looks to me to be a strange text to be talking about the coming into the world of a baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to use this because I think that some of us, we fit into this text. Matthew chapter 11 comes on the heel of Jesus' miracles that he was done in chapter 8 and 9. He's done miracles. He's healed people. He, he's had this, this, this ministry that has been magnetic. It's been attractive. Everywhere Jesus went, sickness had to leave. Where, where Jesus showed up, Blindness, deafness, dumbness, all of these things had to go. Je Jesus had crowds that followed him. He was attractional. And the reason why, and, 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 and we look at our culture today, we find people who are attractional, who attract people, but they, they have certain advantages that Jesus did not have. You need to know that when Jesus preached, when he, when he went around in his ministry, he did not have Facebook. He did not have a news outlet that could carry the news about what he was doing. He did not have Instagram. He did not have any social media platform. He did not have anybody to manage his campaign. He did not have anybody who could brand him, put him out in the public eye. But the Bible says everywhere he went, there were throngs of people. We know of two occasions where Jesus uh, had to prepare a uh, lunch for a crowd. One crowd, uh, over 5,000 men, not counting women and children. Conservative estimates suggest that that was about a crowd of about at least 12,000 people. Another instance, he fed over 4,000. Jesus had the power to draw people. He, he, he went around doing all kinds of things. But when we get to Matthew chapter 11, it, it, it changes the mood. In the prior three chapters, he's been healing. He's been doing exploits. But in chapter number 11, Jesus is confronted with a problem. He has a cousin. He, he has a relative who is incarcerated. 
who has a relative who won't be home for Christmas, who has gotten in trouble, and, and understand that his relative, he is known by his nickname. He, he goes under the moniker John the Baptizer. Now, now, don't get him mixed up with John the Beloved who wrote, Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. That, that's not the same, same John. This is John, the one who went to the Jordan River and called people vipers and snakes and told them, who warned you to, of the danger that was coming? He stood in the Jordan baptizing people and telling them to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right, right, right. I'm declaring one time while John was in the Jordan River baptizing Jews who were followers of Abraham and telling them to get ready because God was about to do something brand new. Here comes his cousin, and his cousin's name is Jesus. And when John sees him coming down the coast of the Jordan, he says to his boys, Behold, the Lamb of God. Right, 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 right. John, John stops his baptismal effort and says, This is the one I have been telling y'all about. The Lamb of God is coming. Then when cousin meets cousin, now, Jesus steps into the Jordan with John and says to John the baptizer, I want you to baptize me. Right, right, right. John said, that's problematic. It's not that I physically can't baptize you, but I knew you when I was in my mama's womb. And, and I know about you, Jesus, that you have come all the way down from heaven. And my baptism is about repentance. And the way I understand you, Jesus, is you have never sinned. Therefore, you need not to repent. Jesus stood in the Jordan with John and said, John, I, I, I know you understand the theological ramifications of me not being a sinner, but understand, John, now you don't understand why I'm asking you this, but suffer it to be so. I need you to baptize me, not because I am sinful. Right, right. But there are some folk in Jersey City who need to know that I practice what I preach. John baptized Jesus. And if you go there and, and you read the story of Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3, the Bible declared that one of the first times we see in the Bible that the Godhead has been united on earth. They've always been united in heaven. That's why Jesus said when you pray, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, here in, in, in the Jordan, John has taken Jesus and has submerged him in the water. And when he takes him and puts him into the Jordan River, the Bible declares that heaven moves. Right, right, right. Yeah, there, 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 there is from heaven a, 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 a form that descends, that comes out of heaven and lands on him like a dove. And, and its presence envelops him. But not only is there that which comes from heaven uh, that meets him in the water, but the Bible declares that, that, that somewhere beyond the clouds, there is an audible voice. Yes, yeah. And the voice declares to John and all of those who are present, this is my beloved son. Right, 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 sir. Right. And whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. I always tell men, I always tell young folk that you gotta understand God is the ultimate parent. He understands about what it means to be a good parent. And when Jesus is in the Jordan, he has not started his ministry. He is beginning. He, he, he is getting baptized of John. But the Bible declares, the Father says, this is my boy. 
I love him and I want you to know I'm pleased in him and I want you to listen to him. Now I want you to get this parents that Jesus to that point had not started his earthly ministry. He had not performed miracles. He had not done anything at all worthy of that sort of recognition. But the father said I'm pleased in him. Can, can I help you with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of us, we want to wait till our children do something great. Right. We want to wait till they do what we think they ought to do. But the Father says, I am pleased with him, even though he has not even begun his ministry. Can, 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 can I get an amen on that? You need to be pleased in your children. Stop waiting for them to do something. You only have happy just for God gave you to John, John sees this Jesus in the water. He sees the, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit descend on him. He hears the voice of God the Father speaking in an audible voice. There you have it in the Jordan River. The Father from heaven, the Holy Spirit descending from on high, and the Son of God standing in the water. The Trinity, the Godhead, has showed up. Right in front of John the Baptist. John, I, I've been looking at this text and I said, Boy, if anybody ought to have certainty, if anybody ought to be sure of what they believe, it ought to have been John the Baptist. John said he's the man of God, the Holy Spirit descends on him, and the Father speaks from heaven. That's the God he is. In chapter 11, I want to help somebody with this. Sometimes our religion changes because of our location. Did you hear me? Sometimes location affects our religion. Y'all hear that? See, sometimes when we're in the Jordan and we are preaching uh, by the shore, we are excited, we are motivated, we are on fire for God, but, but, but let, let somebody change your location from the Jordan to a jailhouse. Let somebody take you from your familiar environment to an unfamiliar place and you will find out that a lot of us, our understanding of God changes because of our location. Now, can I get a witness? Some of us act different in here. Some of us act different here than we do when we get to another location. So, some of us have gotten this so down pat that we know exactly how to move, we know how to act, we know how to jump, we know how to dance, but when we change our location, it affects our profession. John is okay in the Jordan. He's okay uh, as a itinerant preacher. He's okay uh, speaking to the masses, but now his location has changed. He's on death row. A lot of us need to be honest and start checking ourselves and start asking ourselves personally, do, do I change my relationship with God based on my location? Am I all for God in New Hope? And when I get out of New Hope, does my location affect? Oh, y'all in here. John, John is no longer experiencing the limelight. Folk are coming from miles around to be baptized. In fact, he's been on death row and he knows that only a little bit of time he's going to lose his head. Did I tell y'all how he got him in the big house? Now I know everybody, y'all know, y'all got family members, everybody up in the big house, you know, they didn't do it. They been framed. The system got them, 
but they didn't do it. Y'all know anybody that didn't do it? Oh, I see y'all, y'all, y'all. They ain't telling the truth up in here. Everybody I know, when they go up there, they, they, they just got me framed. They framed me. They, John, John got in prison because he spoke up. He saw the king was having a relationship with his brother's wife. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, he, he, and he had the nerve to go tell people while standing under the portico where the king could hear him that it was wrong. And John believed that nobody was above the law. And he told the king, King, this is sin and a shame. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. King was afraid of John because John, John was like crazy. He, he ate grasshoppers <laughs> and wild honey. He, he didn't wear designer clothes. He, he wore stuff like camel's hair. He, he, he didn't even shave or cut his hair. He had taken a vow as a Nazarite. And, and if you looked at him, he looked like a denizen. He looked like somebody who was crazy, somebody out of his mind. But the people loved John. Right, right, right. So one day King decides he's gonna have a big party. You know, he had a party invited everybody. You know, everybody he knew he invited him to the party. And his stepdaughter decided that she gonna do this sensual dance, this erotic dance. He might call it a lap dance. <laughs> I mean she danced like you know, they had a pole up. I'm sorry. She, she danced, she danced. She danced so provocatively. And the King Herod was so drunk, Philip. He said to her, Girl, I'll give you half of my king. Dancing like that. You name it. Now you know she must have been, you know. Something that he was going to give her half the king. She, she said, name, he said, name your price. She, she looked over at mama. Mama gave her the go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, what I want is the head of John the Baptist on the silver plate. And the king said, why you ask for that? Amen. I would have given you half of my kingdom. Amen. Amen. But the people believe John is from God. Mm -hmm. And I can't kill him. He's a prophet. Well, hold on. He just promised in front of everybody. Had John put in jail. Gave the date for his execution. John, when you're in solitude, you got a lot of time to think. John thinks aloud. And he tells us in chapter 11 verse number 3 his boys come to visit him they have visitation they come and visit with John and John said now I want y'all to go find Jesus and ask him for me are you the one or should we look for someone else yes, sir. Yes, sir. I thought about that Sister Dorsey, I've been like, if anybody ought to know, yes, sir. you would have thought it would have been John the Baptist. Right, sir. But John reminds us that as we get ready to make room for Christmas, that for some of us, we really can't make room for Jesus because we haven't settled the questions of our own doubt. I'll be honest with you, some of us in here, we've been shouting uh -huh. on mama's religion. That's right. That's right. We've been shouting on daddy's yes. 
experience. But baby, I come to tell you at some point you got to make it up in your mind for yourself. You got to know that you know for yourself. John says, I want to know, is he the one? Because it's like a lot of us who come to church and we shout about Jesus and then the world keeps saying, well, if he's real, how come there's evil in the world? If he's real, how come 45 still in the white house? If he's real, how come my situation hasn't changed? I want you to get this, I want you to get this. So Kim, I want you to get this, then I'm going to go, all right? But, but Jesus' response to John's disciple is, go tell John both what you have seen and heard. I want you to get this. Watch this, watch this. Jesus tells John's disciples, go tell John what you've seen and heard. Go back and tell John what he already knows. Ain't no new revelation. John already knew what I was coming for. He already knew what I was about. Yes, I'm about a kingdom. Yes, I'm about this. But tell John that the blind see, the poor, uh, you know, have the gospel preached to them. The deaf hear. Those who've been in bondage have been set. John, tell John that it's not a new story. A lot of times when we get upset, when we can feel an anxiety, when we think that tomorrow's not going to come, we need to go back and remember that the same God who brought you on yesterday is the same God who will keep you today and tomorrow. If he did it before, he will do it again. He said, tell John, ain't no new news. Oh, yeah. So they are listening with John and said, John, how you gonna react when Jesus come back and when his disciples come back and tell you? Look out your window. Right. And some of us need to understand that even if God doesn't reverse our present situation, even if he doesn't come and turn our lives upside down, he's still God. Right. Oh God in here. Yeah, John, I know you're anxious. I know you're alone. I know you're afraid of dying. I know that you've invested all of your life in this and now you won't serve it. But Jesus said, John, I'm not giving you no brand new revelation, but I want you to remember that I am the same God and I will not change. Even if I don't bring you through this, I'll be with you. Following some of us around this time of the year, and we want God to change stuff. And God said, I'm God if I don't change your situation. I'm God if I don't put a gift under your tree. I'm God if I don't fix your situation. God said, Look at here, I promise you that I would be with you always, even till the end of the age. That means in every good time. Even if I don't 
to show up and visit you in person. Yes, sir. And I'll be with you. Yes, sir. Some of us, we only, we only thank God is there when we can physically experience it. But they all ever been in trouble. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If anybody in here ever seriously been down, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and, and everybody around you looked at you and said, yes, she ain't getting up. Have you ever been out there and you got so out there that you knew that you could never find your way back and folk looked at you and said, you out there. Yeah. Oh, but the God who promised said, even when you're out there, could I, 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 Let's go by Luke chapter 15 and see if God is a God who can keep his word. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the Bible declared that there was a man who had two sons. The youngest one asked for all of his inheritance. Oh, yeah. Went out there and wasted everything he had on righteous living. Uh, he, he was a prodigal. He wasted all of his resources that his daddy had provided. He spent all his money on wine, women, and sober. One day his wine ran out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, the women walked out and his song played out. But one day the Bible declared when he was almost at his worst that he came to himself and said, back home, my daddy got servants who are doing better than I am. So I believe I'll go home and i hire myself out to my daddy and be a hired servant. But the Bible declared on his way home. What he didn't know was that while he was on his way home, that every night his father would look out the window. Every day the father would send word in Anybody seeing my son? And I come to tell you, if you've ever been lost, uh, you weren't really by yourself. But 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 when you came to yourself, the same God uh, who walked with you out the door declared, "I'll never leave you. Uh, I'll be with you always." Have I got a witness? Uh, when you think you're by yourself, when when you think you can't make it, when when you think you're by Give up. I, I heard Jesus say, John, remember I, that I'll be with you in all of your trouble. I, I'll be with you even when it comes time to die. Have I got a witness? And you got to know the kind of God we serve. He shows up when things are good, but he also shows up when they're bad. He shows up when I can see him. But he also shows up when I can't see him. Have I got a witness? Every now and then, I can't see him. I can't even feel him. But I'm so glad that he reminds me that when you fell down, when you were able to get back up, it wasn't because of your strength.
much you come to Jesus. This is what it's all about. That's why we preach, that's why we pray. So this season, you won't be so filled with anxiety that you tell people, I'm getting sick. I don't know how I'm going to make it. Well, you made it last year. You made it the year before that. You need to understand sometimes. If your child had a choice between you and a toy, they take you every time. You buy them a toy before they go back to school and broke. Come on now. You don't spend the rent money. Thank you. 